And today he's going to talk to you about a specific part of this book and something we call EQ. So how many people have heard of IQ? Like your IQ, like if you're smart, right? So EQ, anyone know what EQ is? I'm sorry? Emotional, right, emotional quotient. So it's emotional intelligence. It's not intellectual intelligence. It's emotional intelligence. It has to do with self-awareness. It has to do with understanding and, and um, being smart about interactions with people, which I think are probably the most important skill you could have um, in your life. So um, without further ado, if you give Chris your attention, when he's done, I will give you um, the directions of where we're going to go after this. So Mr. Connor, if you want to come on up. tangible and intangible impact on your educational experience here at Porter Gout. So I'll start, uh, be a smarty pants here and show you what your mission is. Um, so the Porter Gout mission is that the school strives to create an environment that nurtures and protects what we value most in our children, their faith, curiosity, talents, integrity, humanity, and dreams. And so what I'm here today to do is give you guys that foundation on EQ uh, to try to provoke some thought and inspire you to think a little bit deeper uh, on ways that can affect your life, but also how it can improve uh, the lives of the fellow students here at Porter Gap. Felt like it made sense to just kind of give you that definition up front of what emotional intelligence is. And so a lot of people today know emotional intelligence based on an uh, international best-selling book by an author by the name of Daniel Goleman. Uh, emotional intelligence was actually really founded and started uh, in an academic paper by two different uh, professors, Dr. Peter Salovey and John Mayer. No, not the great guitarist, Dr. John Mayer. So EQ is the ability to recognize understand and manage our emotions, and to recognize, understand, and influence the emotions of our peers. Being aware that emotions can drive our behavior and impact both positively and negatively, and learning how to manage these emotions of our own and others, especially when we are under pressure. So really, I think, uh, just to kind of to what their words were, so much of what EQ is really about is just being able to understand and manage our emotions, and to be able to make sense of those and understand the emotions of other people. So Mr. Tate in the beginning talked a little bit about IQ, EQ. I think so much of what you'll find in your educational experience here, both in the classroom and out, is that emotional intelligence goes a long way toward defining your success, to helping you to make sense of who you are, and as you guys continue to mature and grow into being young men, emotional intelligence is really going to help you uh, further yourself, know who you really are, understand your passions, your emotions, the things that really matter most to you. But it's such an important uh, part of how you are able to help other people. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here today. What do you guys think of this chart right here? Does this seem to be legit? Does this seem to be true to you? How many people think yes? How many people think no? How many people think that these are really just stereotypes and things that are boxes that society tries to make us fit in? To those of you who raised your hand last year, so really what this chart up here is, is stereotypes. And unfortunately, 
the society we live in, we try to put people in boxes and we try to think that boys behave one way and girls behave another and that there are certain aspects or characteristic traits that really only fit one gender. Whereas in reality, with emotional intelligence, we really all, as boys, as girls, as we mature into, uh, in this room, young men, we all have the ability to be emotionally intelligent. You know, all of us in life are truly blessed and given God-given talents. Emotional intelligence is something that really can be socially cultivated and learned. It, these are qualities that all of us can pick up as we go along, we can get better at. So I would say to you that all of you, we can all be empathetic. We can all exercise empathy in our lives, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that looks like. We can all be self-aware and considerate of our peers and friends. We can analyze our needs and wants. We can behave with altruism. So altruism is really just thinking, doing kind things for the benefit of other people, and how important that is. And all of us can adapt. A critical pillar of emotional intelligence is adaptability. The ability to move forward, to know when to change course, or to know when to stay the course as life around us changes. This young man right here, I'd like to believe, is the next Mike Trout. He's actually my four-year-old son, one of the best baseball players at the age of four here in Charleston, in my very humble and biased opinion. So much of what makes my son Roman a great young man is that he really takes the time to make sense of his experiences. He really is very in touch with what he's feeling and his emotions, and he cares deeply about the players on his team and the kids that he goes to school with. So I'll give you what the, uh, the definition of empathy is. It's the capacity to understand or feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference. For example, the capacity to place yourself in somebody else's position. So when we talk about emotional intelligence, empathy is really one of those absolute cornerstone qualities of emotional intelligence. Uh, getting further into a little bit more about what empathy is, so it's kind of broken down into two areas. So effective empathy is really being able to take on and feel what someone else is experiencing, to really empathize with them on a level that when we see a classmate who's angry or sad, or maybe they're really excited and passionate and happy about their basketball game that afternoon, it's really being able to embrace that way that they're feeling and take that on for ourselves and empathize in that capacity. Cognitive empathy is more of the ability to just take a perspective, to be able to analyze and recognize what someone else is feeling emotionally and, and take it for what it is. It could be anger, fear, sadness, happiness. So really trying to just be cognizant, to be empathetic, to your classmates here at school. I think what you're gonna find is that the more you practice empathy, the more friends, the more great experiences, the more relationships that you will build. And so much of you know, going through a, a school experience for you guys is really being able to uh, add more awesome people. And so many of you guys in the room here, as you get to know one another, you're gonna learn so much from each other, things that go way beyond uh, just what you learn in the classroom. So I wanted to share this video. Some of you in the room may be familiar with um, one of my absolute favorite authors and, and a, an international best-selling author. Uh, her name is Dr. Brene Brown. And she's really cornered the market on emotional intelligence, authenticity. She talks a lot about vulnerability and she's a really great voice in that realm. And so I wanted to share this video with you guys and it's about two and a half minutes here. So just give me one sec. Um, I will get it up. So what is empathy? And why is it very different from empathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's, a, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied 
professions, very diverse professions, were going to be as relevant, and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person, or recognize the perspective of their truth. Staying out of judgment, not even when you enjoy it, which is most of us do. Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy, it's feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space where someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, calm down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, it's bad, huh? Uh, no. Do you want a sandwich? Ah. Empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, is an empathic response begin with at least. I have it, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So, I had a miscarriage. At least you know you think you're pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversation is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I would if you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so bad at talking. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. You guys think of that video? Give you a better understanding of empathy? Awesome. So moving forward, uh, getting on to another big area of emotional intelligence is self-awareness. Really, uh, I think of it in two ways. It's the art of understanding yourself and recognizing that your emotions and actions uh, can affect others and how they affect others. But it's also recognizing the way that others may perceive us. And that's a little bit more of an advanced uh, part of self-awareness. So it's really it's recognizing everything that you guys are going to be facing uh, during your school day. You know, your interaction with your classmates, how you're doing in the classroom, whether you're in sports and music, uh, performing up here on the stage, maybe in the drama club or things of that nature. It's recognizing every single thing that's coming your way, and having that self-awareness to be able to analyze and process those emotions and get uh, greater comfort around the way that you feel. Another area that I think of when I think of emotional intelligence is just the distinction of being able to understand and have clarity around what your needs and wants are. So all of us as we go through life, uh, we're going to progress further when we're really able to have an ability to understand well, what are the things that we really need? What are the things that we need to be able to sustain us and uh, as we continue to move forward in the education here? So obviously being able to do well in the classroom being able to understand new concepts and new ideas that you learn that are going to help you and continue to build as you move forward and, and build a better foundation here at the school versus the things to have that are more uh, wants, you know, so being able to maybe just, you know, play certain games on your phone or just other things that are not necessarily what you need, but making sense and, and really through 
uh, what you learn in the classroom through you know, finding mentors here at the school, through faculty and staff, being able to get clarity around the things that you need to be the best student, to be the best person, best classmate in sports, to be the best teammate, understanding what you need versus understanding what you want. And so I thought I'd just tell a quick story. Uh, does everybody know who this guy is up on the screen right here? How many of you guys actually know his real life story? So Ed Sheeran uh, grew up in England, and really when he was a kid, uh, had a big stuttering problem. He had a surgery that was supposed to help him with something completely unrelated to his own vision, uh, but it ended up affecting his vision. He had a lazy eye, he stuttered, kids at school made fun of him, and he had a really difficult time uh, making sense of what his place in the world was. But what he found as he continued to get older was that music was really what his passion was. Uh, he talks about, uh, in some of the speeches that he gives, he talks about when he was younger, he was actually given uh, a music album by his father, and he really memorized all of the different lyrics. And as he uh, began to play his own music and write his own music, that literally broke him out of the stuttering problem that he had. And so he dug into his passion, and he realized that, you know, what I need in life is to be myself. And as he learned more about what his identity was as a musician and as a songwriter, he got deeper and deeper into that meaning of what he was all about. He talked about when he was younger that when he stuttered, when he had a lazy eye, he had uh, his red hair, as you can very plainly see on the screen, kids made fun of him for that. And think about that, something that you're born with that is genetic that you have no control over. And other kids made fun of him and made him feel low. He literally turned that to his advantage. He embraced, as he got older, all of the quirks and as he talks about all of the things that made him weird. And like I said, he realized that what he needed was just to be himself all along. And once he started being himself, he became really one of the best-selling musical artists of the last long period of time and an international superstar that has literally played around the world to sold out arenas and stadiums. So when we talk about needs and wants, I think it's really a matter of needing to just be yourself and knowing who you are and how important emotional intelligence is and helping you to comprehend that. So something that as we get into the breakout sessions here following the talk, I'll give you a little uh, taste of this right now. So a question for you guys to think about. What can my classmates do to improve my experience here at Porter Gap? As you look around and you see your friends, you maybe see some of the guys that you don't know quite as well. But as you try to get to know who these people are and understand what makes them tick, think about what are those things that they could be doing to help you get better every single day here at school. I talked a little bit earlier about adaptability, so really, again, just to kind of boil that down, it's knowing when to stay the course on what you're doing. You know, if you have a method for studying that's helping you get A grades on your test, if you have a way that you're effective at writing papers and you're getting really positive feedback from your teachers and from the faculty here, stay the course with that. If there's something that's not working for you, recognize that you may not be getting the results that you want, and look into all the ways that you can try to improve. What are the things that you can do? What is the help that you can seek, either from a fellow classmate, from all of the faculty and staff here? I'm telling you, there's a lot of great people at this school that want nothing more than to see you succeed, and they're willing to do whatever it takes to help you get there. So knowing when you need to change course and adapt. And I used the example, uh, for those of you who were in the room a month ago, I talked a little bit about Steph Curry and his journey to becoming, really at this point in time, one of the greatest basketball players to ever live. But it wasn't always that way for him. And he wrote an article a couple months ago for an amazing publication called The Player's Tribune. He talked about when he was the age that many of you in the room are right now, he was playing AAU basketball, and to be totally honest with you, he was getting his butt kicked. He really wasn't that good. And his mom and dad spoke with him when he was about 11 or 12 years old in a hotel room in Tennessee during an AAU tournament, and they said, Steph, you have the option right now to stop playing and quit, or to tell yourself that you're going to commit to being the absolute best player that you can be. 
Not the best player in the world, not the best three-point shooter in the NBA at the age of 11 or 12, of course. To being the absolute best player that you can be and committing to that excellence with focus, clarity, discipline, and competitive greatness. And doing it with all of your heart and soul. And he talked about how powerful and transformative that experience was, and from that moment on, he was absolutely unwilling to accept excuses. He decided to keep going. He didn't even get many scholarship offers. He ended up going to a small school in North Carolina, some of you may be familiar with, called Davidson College, great liberal arts college. But he was always underappreciated, always underrated. And there were always times that he had to decide, do I continue believing in this crazy basketball dream? Or do I give up? Do I try to do something else, something admirable, something maybe like a doctor or lawyer, but not one of the best basketball players in the world? So from a very young age, because of his parents, because of the people around him, he was able to adapt and understand what he needed to do to succeed and become one of the best players in the world. The desire to help others succeed and to succeed for yourself, we talked a little bit earlier about that altruistic mindset of just having a genuine desire of wanting to see your fellow classmates do well and how much that ends up rubbing off on yourself. And in that process, when you really want to see other people do well, and you burn with desire, and you care that they're uh, fulfilled and happy in what they're doing, that ends up coming back to you in a reciprocal fashion, and ends up making you a lot better. Does anyone know who this guy is on the screen? <laughs> so in about 48 hours, uh, a couple miles up the road in the state capital of Columbia, uh, Duke University is going to be playing in the NCAA tournament. And only just last week did Zion Williams come back and recovered from a knee injury, came back and played in the ACC tournament, and put on you know, one of the greatest uh, exhibitions of three-day basketball probably any of us have ever seen. So we know him today, he's going to be the number one pick in the NBA draft. Please, I ask you to hope and pray that the New York Knicks, my hometown team, somehow drafts this guy in a few months. It's desperately needed. What struck me about his character was something that he said following the game against Syracuse last Thursday night. They interviewed him and they asked him how it felt to be back and what it meant to win and to be back wearing a Duke uniform. And what he said amounted basically it boiled down to this. I wanted to be there for my teammates. Almost every single word out of his mouth was, I love Duke basketball, I love my teammates, I care about my teammates, I love my teammates. It wasn't about him. He just genuinely wanted to be there for the people that he loves and cares about. It means so much to him to be part of a team. And I thought, you know, isn't that amazing for a guy that many people look at as one of the best college basketball players to be coming out and soon to be entering the pros that maybe any of us have ever seen. And he wasn't talking about himself, he was talking about his teammates, and he was talking about his fellow classmates at Duke University. And that really struck a chord with me, and it's a, a very altruistic mindset that if one of the absolute best basketball players in the world can adopt and have, I think all of us can. Another thought, how does it make me feel when I help and care and do nice things for my classmates? I think in the interest of time, I'm actually going to uh, skip this story here, uh, Mr. Tate, um, just kind of fast forward. Uh, so, I, I know that one of the things that Mr. Tate, you guys talk a lot about here at the school in Leadership 101 is around flow. Um, really the way I think of it, especially from a sports mindset mentality, is, you know, being in the zone. What does it feel like to you? And this is a big part of emotional intelligence. It's not just a result or an outcome. What does it feel like to know that you are in the flow, that you're doing something, that when you're doing it, it's as if time has stopped around you, and you just feel so empowered, so happy, so incredibly passionate about what you're doing. You know you're doing well. You know the people around you know you're doing well, but they also recognize and can feel for themselves through empathy that you love what you do, and that in that moment in time, literally nothing else matters. What does it feel like to get to that place? How do you get to that place? I mean, if you guys have the answer, 
By all means, please tell me, because I'm always looking to get there myself. Okay. What does it feel like to be in that zone? Just again, keep learning about yourself. One of the best parts of your education at this school, and I promise you this, because I was in your shoes not that long ago, it is vitally important what you learn in the classroom, and I would never tell you otherwise. It is just as vitally important what you learn about yourself, how you make sense of your emotions, how you understand your fellow classmates. Make that a key part of your educational experience, and I promise you that it will take you incredible places in life. It will help you build relationships, it will bring new opportunities into your life that are gonna bring you joy and incredible happiness. Just again, another thing we're gonna talk about shortly. I ask you to think as you walk away today, especially from the breakout session, what are three things that you can commit to that will make your classmates feel happier, but more significantly, I would actually say, even more fulfilled in who they are here at Porter Gap. I close with a quote. Uh, I talked a little bit earlier about the book that really put emotional intelligence on the map, self uh, titled Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goleman. What really matters for success, character, happiness, and lifelong achievements is a definite set of emotional skills. Your emotional intelligence, not just purely cognitive abilities that are measured by conventional IQ tests. So that's all I got today. You can see my, my son Roman there, my wife and son. That's just a little bit about me. As uh, Mr. Tate talked about, I've written a book called The Value of You. I love coming in here to talk to you guys, and it's a big part of what gives me energy. I hope that you can find that energy and that passion for yourself, and emotional intelligence is really a great foundation of how you're gonna get there. So thank you so much for having me here today. I look forward to seeing you guys at the breakout sessions. Have a great spring break, and I wish you guys to watch the rest of the way. Let's give one more round of applause for coming out.